good people uh, around you. Uh, you can thank the University of Hawaii for the copies of this. <laughs> I had a bunch in my office and I said, oh, also make use of it. Yeah, bring them up to the mauna. Okay, uh, as I explained before, my name is Keanu. Um, I have a PhD in political science. I'm not Hawaiian studies. My area is actually international relations and public law, in particular constitutional law, administrative law, international law. So the focus of my doctoral research and articles and publications uh, addresses Hawaii as a country and that it still exists, okay? So this particular workshop, this class that we're gonna be doing here is gonna be focusing on what happened in 1893, right? A lot of people think January 17th is when it started. Actually, it's January 16th, and I'll explain that, okay? So before we go there, I gotta talk about a bit uh, regarding terminology. Um, have any of you saw or attended the talk I gave last time on terminology? I use the example of squid luau. That's not squid in the luau. So stop calling it squid luau. <laughs> okay. In this case, we got to keep saying, instead of saying squid luau, we got to say, we got to stop saying the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. Okay. Because there was no overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. It was an overthrow of the Hawaiian government that's separate from the kingdom which is the country okay and that's a part of this article right here that goes into detail that was published by the national education association okay so when i'm talking about the hawaiian kingdom i'm talking about the country and to use a point of reference my great grandfather on both mom and dad's side from the kingdom era but i'm gonna focus on my great grandfather william kuakini simerson William Kuakini Simerson was born in 1880, okay? That's my tutu's dad. In 1880, the country, the Hawaiian Kingdom, existed. Not the sovereignty group, the Hawaiian Kingdom, the country called the Hawaiian Kingdom, okay? Now, that Hawaiian Kingdom that he was a part of, he was a national or a citizen of that country. He didn't know anything about America other than what he read in the newspapers, right? He never visited the United States. He was from Napopo. So the family, my family is born, uh, buried at Kahikolu Church, yeah, in Napopo. The Simerson Ohana. So that's the country that I'm talking about, okay? And all of us here, if we are native, we're descendant of Hawaiian subjects. And we're only talking, like for myself, three generations, yeah, just three. We're not talking Umiali Loa 1400s. We're talking right around the corner, okay? And that's important. But people also may be Hawaiian today who are not native. Okay, so the Hawaiian Kingdom. What was the Hawaiian Kingdom? So this is the history of the Hawaiian Kingdom before we get into what took place in 1893. So the time of King Kamehameha I, he was the king of Hawaii Island, the kingdom of Hawaii. Kaikili was the kingdom was the king of Maui, the Maui Kingdom. And Kael, the brother of Kaikili, was the king of Kauai. So what you had was three separate kingdoms throughout these islands. All right? Okay? Now, Kamehameha consolidated the Hawaiian kingdom. He con well, sorry. He consolidated these other kingdoms into one kingdom through conquests. Right? So the kingdom of Maui was consolidated in 17... What's that? 1796, right? After the Battle of Nu'uanu, okay? Kauai, okay, which was under Kamuali, the son of Kaeo, Kamuali agreed to recognize Kamehameha I as his lord. So it wasn't a conquest, right? It was like the term that was used, ali'i ana, chiefing. In English, they call it a vassal state, a vassal state under Kamehameha, right? Now, after Kamehameha died, Liholio came into power. He was a successor. You had a rebellion in Kauai. George Humehume, the son of Kamuali'i, rose up with the Kauai chiefs in an attempt to overthrow the kingdom of Kauai that was occupying their territory. They lost. And all those Kauai chiefs were replaced by Hawaii Island chiefs. So when people say today that Kauai wasn't conquered, 
they weren't conquered under Kamehameha the first, but they were conquered under Kamehameha the second. Okay. So, so when you when you look at now the consolidation of these kingdoms, at first, Kamehameha referred to himself as the king of the Sandwich Islands. Sandwich Islands. That's what he referred to himself as. Why did he refer to himself as the king of the Sandwich Islands, especially with the word sandwich? Anybody know? Did you know that King Kamehameha I, when he was still the king of Hawaii, in 1794, he joined the British Empire. He became British. Okay? Exactly. So, when Captain Cook arrived here, right, when Kamehameha was a young chief, under colonial Pu'u, right, the Earl of Sandwich from Great Britain is, is who funded Captain Cook's travels. So Captain Cook, when he came here, he named these islands as the Sandwich Islands out of respect for the guy who was paying for his trip, right, from the British Admiralty. So Kamehameha, when he joined the British Empire in 1794, he became British. Now what is the term British? Anybody know? What is British? What does British refer to? Britain. Britain is an island. Yeah? Britain is an island. It's not a people. Right? So when you say British, you're referring to a country. Great Britain. Now within the country of Great Britain, you had different ethnicities, different nations. You got the English. Yeah? You got the Welsh. You got the Scots. But they're all sitting in Britain. So Britain is the country, the United Kingdom of Great Britain, and British is the nationality or the citizenship. So when Kamehameha joined the British Empire, he didn't become a colony of Great Britain. He became a protectorate, a British protectorate. The important point here is that Kamehameha, if Hawaii was colonized by the British, Kamehameha would not be king. The British would send what is called a governor a governor general who represents the king in the colonies. And that's exactly what happened in Canada, in Australia, and in Aotearoa. They sent the governor general there, right? And that was the head of the government. But in Hawaii, the chiefs maintained their authority. There was no doubt. But as far as external matters, that's when the British kick in. They're gonna protect Hawaii from outside influences because they're part of the British Empire. So Kamehameha was actually British. Now Kamehameha had to begin that process of aligning himself up with British custom, right? Now this idea of a chief or a king coming under another king, Hawaii understood that. That's what they normally did. There was a guy named Kaiana. You guys know who Kaiana is? Kaiana is a high chief who rebelled against Maui chiefs, okay? He lost, he sought refuge on Kauai, the kingdom of Kauai. There was a, a, a captain, uh, Captain Mears, he was on a ship called the, uh, named the Nutka. And Captain Mears was asked by Kaiana if he could board the Nutka and travel with him to China. So Kaiana was going to China. He went to the Philippines. He went all over and what he was doing was he was gathering weapons for his chiefs. So when he arrived back in uh, Kauai, Kaiana saw that Ka Kael did not have that same look on his face. He had that look of possible rebellion because he has all this weaponry and now he becomes a threat because he had a failed rebellion in Maui. So that's when Kaiana says to uh, Captain Mears, take me to Hawaii Island. And that is when Kaiana joined Kamehameha's forces and he was given a moku for his chiefs. And every time Kamehameha called, called the chiefs for war, he was one of the ones who came up along with the other chiefs, right? And that's what was mobilizing the army, right? Now, Kaiana fell into disfavor with Kamehameha. Uh, something along the lines of Ka'ahumanu. Yeah. So when they was on Mo uh, Molokai, getting ready to invade Oahu and defeat the Maui Kingdom against Kalani Kupule, which led to the Battle of Nu'uanu. Kamehameha called the Council of Chiefs together for a battle planning. Kaiana wasn't called. Kaiana went, ooh. 
I think something's up. So he went before the Armada heading to Oahu. He went before them, rejoined the Maui kingdom where he started, and he fought with Kalane Kupule, where he eventually died. So Kayana is an amazing story. It's an epic story where he started off in the Maui kingdom. He went to Kauai, went to Hawaii, and went, ended up in Maui. So you got, you know, romance, you got battles. I mean, that's gonna make a good movie. I heard maybe Jason Momoa might be involved with that. I don't know. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so that idea of aligning yourself up with kings, Kamehameha understood that. So when Kamehameha aligned himself up with King George III, the biggest power, the largest power, military power in the world at that time, that was like a major benefit, align yourself up. So Kamehameha had to uh, start transforming his kingdom into being British, right? But what's interesting is Kamehameha was not pretending to be British. He knew British was the nationality. Kanaka was his ethnicity. His culture was still there. That's important, right? Just like the Scots in Great Britain still got their culture. Just like the English got their culture. Well, the Kanaka also had their culture under Kamehameha, right? So after the Battle of Nu'uanu, that's when he introduced the term Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister was Kalanimoku, who's going to take on the name Kalaimoku, the carver of the lands. So under the chiefs, the Kalaimoku would be the most analogous to a Prime Minister. Anybody know where Prime Minister came from, that term? which is pure British. Okay, it actually started off with King George I. The time of Kamehameha, you're talking about King George III. He's the third King George, right? The successor. King George I, he wasn't from England, but he was a successor to the throne. He came from Hanover. Hanover is in Germany, right? King George I couldn't speak English. He's in London, and he's trying to be king, but he's getting homesick. So he keeps going back to Hanover, leaving the British government without a king. So all those ministers that was under King George I, they was like, hey, how do we, how do we run government? The king's not here. That gradually grew into what is called, they picked one minister as the main minister, and that minister was the one in charge of the treasury, the purse, right? And that minister of the treasury came to be known as the main minister which eventually was called the prime minister you guys see that logic that's a pure british invention Kamehameha needed to do something like that so he created the position of prime minister with kalanimoku right but kalanimoku didn't have other ministers like the british had it was just one guy so calling him the main minister never really fit but you can see Kamehameha is trying to use the right terms, trying to play this game, right? One thing you don't want to do is anger the chief that you under. Just like the chiefs who was under Kamehameha, don't like Ka'iana, don't anger the king. So Kamehameha knew that. That's how Ali'is were at that time. They aligned themselves up with power. The issue back then was not being ha'a ha'a, was actually who has the mana, right? That's how it worked at that time. So, Kamehameha the first also asked Captain Vancouver if he could send British missionaries to Hawaii. Because that's another part they got to change, right? Because under the Hawaiian religion, the idea of sacrificing people at Pukohola doesn't sit too well with Christianity, <laughs> which the British were Protestant, right? But the British didn't send uh, missionaries over because at that time of Kamehameha the first King George the third who was a king at that time he went insane yeah, he went nuts right so his son the Prince of Wales became the regent so the term regent is the term that applies when it's a person or person serving the absence of a monarch they're not the monarch they serve in the absence of the monarch now that provision right there, I'm going to jump ahead, in the Hawaiian Kingdom, that insanity experience that Hawaii had with 
their king in Britain informed them to put a particular provision in the Hawaiian Constitution in 1852 as well as in 1864 and it said no one shall sit upon the throne who has been convicted of an infamous crime insane or an idiot how do you like that that's the actual text that they use so if you're an idiot you cannot be king if you're insane you cannot be king <laughs> If you're convicted of an infamous crime, a felony, you cannot be king. So Hawaii had its own check and balance out of experience. Yeah, Not that our kings went insane, <laughs> but King George III did. So we're getting a lot of influence coming in from Great Britain. So when, when, when Kamehameha died, uh, there was a move that was made to bring Hawaii into compliance with British authority. It's the religion. And Kamehameha could not change the religion on his own. He was a wogi chief, right? If anybody can change, or should I say not change, just not bring it back, that would be somebody who was a Niaupio, a high-ranking Ali. That would be Keopuolani, Kamehameha's wife, one of the uh, queens, as well as the son, Liholio. Okay? So basically what happened was when Kamehameha died, Everything went Noah. Noah is to be freed. The religion that was there that prevented women from eating pork, bananas, was lifted. Yeah? The couple that said women and men cannot eat together was lifted. Noah. With the new successor, Kamehameha II, under the ancient system, his job was to bring back the couple. What he did was not bring it back. Right? And that opened the door to set it up for Christianity to come in. So that is when they had Liho Liho and Keopuolani sit together and eat. That was during Noah. They just never brought it back. So this idea of overthrow of the religion, actually it wasn't. Under our custom, it was just not brought back, which was a prerogative of the elite at that time. So here the first missionaries come one year after 1820, after Kamehameha died in 1819. Now, when the missionaries arrived, there was a problem. Christianity, Protestant, but wrong nationality. What missionary showed up in 1820? What country were they from? America. These were American missionaries from the East Coast. Yeah? And on that ship, you had young natives. In fact, one of them was George Hume Hume, the son of Kamuoli'i, right? So they arrived, but Muhulio and Kahumanu, who is now the prime minister, she's, now to run, she's the one who runs government. They refused to allow the missionaries to land. So they stuck on a ship. Keone, uh, John Young, Olohana, okay? He was a British guy that was with Kamehameha I, one of his advisors with Isaac Davis. He goes on a ship and he tells the missionaries, okay, right religion, wrong nationality. You guys not British, you guys American. Now this is in 1820, just eight years earlier was the breakout of the War of 1812 between the British and the Americans. And the British burned down Washington, D.C. So there was ill feeling between Americans and British. The chiefs knew that. And they wanted to make sure these are not agents coming from the United States to take over. So, Cap so Olohana, John Young, advises the missionaries, I'll talk to the Ali'i. So he spoke to Kahumanu and Lihulio and Keopulani and said, they're just religious people. They're not agents of a government. Because American missionaries believed in what is called separation of church and state or church and government, right? Other missionaries, like from Great Britain, the missionaries represent the government. America is something unique, separation of church and state. So they were allowed to land for one year, just one year, and the chiefs was watching them. Now that gives you an idea of who's in control, right? But yet the history books say the Howley missionaries was in control. No, no. They was under the eyes of the chief watching them to make sure they're not agents from the United States. Well, that one-year license was extended for on three more occasions, so a total of four years, they were under the watchful eyes of the chiefs. 
1824, that's when Kahumano as a prime minister said, okay, it's clear you're here to teach the religion, what we've been waiting for, now you teach the people. So Christianity was actually being waited for by the people. It wasn't the missionaries coming in to convert. Actually, the, the people was waiting. And when you think about it, wouldn't you be more conducive to Christianity as opposed to eating a banana and you wahine and you get executed? Yeah? Or eating together with your husband, you get executed. Right? As far as Christianity, you mean all I got to do is just follow you? There's no consequences like somebody going to pull me out in the middle of the night <laughs> when Ilomoku and ping to maintain the kapu system. So you kind of see that this was kind of uh, enticing, this Christianity, because it's very different from, from the ancient religion, right? Especially when the foreigners are coming and the, and the chiefs and the women are watching foreign women eating pork and nothing happening to them. You know, so that gets you to think a little, right? So we have to keep that in mind. It was a very complicated, complex situation. So I'm just touching on some of the main points. Now, here Hawaii is British. They acknowledge themselves as British. You folks also notice that flag with the Union Jack? That's the Hawaiian Kingdom flag. That flag was commissioned, ordered to be uh, made by King Kamehameha I in 1816. That is not the state of Hawaii flag. That's the Hawaiian Kingdom flag. Okay? And that Union Jack does not represent a colony. That rep represents actual relationship with the British. Did you know that Queen Victoria, she was the godmother of Prince Albert, the son of Kamehameha IV. If you go to Queen Emma Summer Palace on Oahu, you see all the gifts given to him by Queen Victoria. That, that road you see in Honolulu called Baritania, that's Hawaiian for Britain. You also have um, Victoria Road, yeah? So you have, we have a lot of connections to the British that are not bad, right? Like our cousins in Aotearoa. They don't have a good experience with the British because you had a, a war that broke out with colonists coming in. Hawaii was still able to control what was going on. So, Hawaii is starting to try to figure out what do they do as a part of the British Empire. That's what prompted Commandment II to travel to London to have a meeting with King George IV. But as we know, Commandment II passed away from measles along with Queen Kalama, his wife at that time. But Boki, Matayo, Kikonawa, they all met with King George IV and he confirmed Hawaii is a British protectorate. He said, you take care of what is within, we take care of what is without, meaning outside of the territory. So it confirmed our British connection. But they never came in to tell us how to run government. They left it up to us. That gradually led to Commandment III to begin to look at Hawaii's government, right? We needed to reform because we're under the ancient feudal system called Ali'iana. Nobody could actually, how, how, do, you, how do you pay uh, teacher salaries when you have people working labor on chief's uh, lands, right? You have produce being given. You got to transform that into some monetary system. You cannot pay the teachers and the policemen with akule, right? So they had to deal with that government reform. 1839, what happened was Commander III sought government reform and he tasked William Richards. William Richards, a former missionary who gave up being a missionary, began to advise Commander III on government reform. First thing he had to do was, where does he get information to teach the chiefs in Lahaina? Lahaina Luna was where they were teaching all the chiefs. Went to Brown University on the East Coast. He was able to have access to a book, or two books, written by Francis Waylands, talked about government reform, right? Also, he had a book called Elements of Political Economy. How's this one? Elements of Political Economy was capitalism infused with values and morality. <laughs> How's that oxymoron, <laughs> right? It's not that laissez-faire capitalism 
that people understand today through Adam Smith's version, right? Dog eat dog. Competition determines the market. Under this economic system, it was infused with, with, with values and morals, morality, and that's what led Hawaii's economic system to be very shared, right? So Hawaii was able to have what is called universal health care, where the government can actually subsidize the budget of Queen's Hospital to take care of natives for free at no cost. They call that socialism today. In Hawaii, that wasn't socialism, that was based upon our economy. It's called take care of your people. And universal health care that was there at Queen's Hospital. That existed before the Scandinavian countries, Norway, Sweden, their healthcare system we talk about today, that actually started after World War II. Hawaii was 1880s, 1890s, and it wasn't like they were trying to impress anybody. They were taking care of the people. That's what it was, right? Also, Hawaii had um, compulsory education. Everybody had to go to school, and they had it 70 years before the United States made it a requirement. When we talk about my great-grandfather in 1880, they was highly educated. Literacy was actually second to Scotland. Amazing, when you think about that. So in 1893, when we're about to get into what's gonna, what went down, people are gonna be informed of what's happening because you have what is called newspapers. Newspapers in the language of Hawaii, as well as in English, putting this thing out, right? So it's from that history and from the laws and from these historical facts is what I'm talking to you about. This is not Keanu's opinion of what happened. I'm just bringing the past to the front. And now you're gonna realize, wow, they actually knew way more than us, but there's a reason. And that's gonna be covered in my second presentation at 315 if you guys are interested. This one is gonna be now getting into 1893. Any questions so far on what I covered? Yes. Well, actually, that was a tension. And did you know a lot of the, our own people who were Christians were actually against the hula because the hula was a representation of the ancient religion because that's what the hula was, the ancient religion, right? So there was some conflict amongst our own people, not the missionaries. The missionaries were saying, yeah, that, that, that's the old religion. Well, let me give you an example to give some context to that. In 1839, Kamehameha III passed an ordinance, a Hawaiian kingdom law, prohibiting the practicing of Catholicism. They call it the Romish faith, yeah, the Pope from Rome. So one of the American diplomats in Hawaii, a commissioner, sent a letter to Commander III and asked, are the American missionaries involved with you establishing that law against Catholics, right? His letter to the commissioner said basically, no, the missionaries came in for religion. We run the government. And then what's interesting is Commandment the Third said, and this religion that is Catholic, it reminds us of the ancient religion because they worship idols. Wow. <laughs> that is from the perspective of a Commandment the Third who knew the ancient religion, who's now Protestant. And what Protestant is, they don't worship idols, right? That's, that's like protesting. That's what the whole thing Protestant was all about. Just to say that he, 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 he equalized to somewhat the ancient religion to Catholicism is pretty amazing, yeah? But he's so honest. He said, no, no, we're not, we, we're in control. They're not in control. Now, eventually, the hula became a part of Hawaii's culture. And that started with Kalakaua. So Kalakaua was actually using the hula as an expression of the country. And that's when you start to see the hula being used. So Hawaii was going through its own evolution of dealing with issues as time progressed, yeah? And what I like about Hawaii's history, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly that I like to see and not just one side, right? And that's what's important about our history, right? You know, like in my own family, I, sometimes I'm not too proud of maybe my cousin and what he did, right? But he's still my cousin. <laughs> and I gotta not justify it but I can try to understand why he did what he did, but he could still be wrong, right? It's not like I gotta cut him out. So what we have in Hawaii is this 
melding of, of culture, international awareness, constitutionalism. It, it, it was a, they say that the amount of time that Hawaii evolved to a constitutional monarchy from 18, I would say from 1810 to 1840, the first constitution, it happened so quick, so quick, as opposed to Great Britain, that took a few hundred years to evolve, for the United States to evolve, right? Here's Hawaii evolving on its own and not trying to speed up because of other people, but they're doing it because they have to deal with real issues. One particular issue happened in 1843, in February. Lord Paulette shows up in Hawaii. Carlton, who was the British consulate here, sent a notice to, to Lord Paulette, a naval officer, saying that the Hawaiian Kingdom is going rogue. They forgot they're British. So Lord Paulette shows up in February, basically forces Commander III to, tr to give up his authority to the British. And he ran Hawaii. And what was flown over the islands was the British flag, the Union Jack by itself, not the Hawaiian flag. That flag was pulled down. Well, Kamehameha, previous to him showing up, Lord Paulette, he already sent out three people to secure recognition of Hawaiian independence. Timoteo Halilio, William Richards, and Sir George Simpson, who was British. So Kamehameha the third said, I will yield my authority on condition that my envoys will be able to succeed in what they do. It was a conditional surrender. Sounds very similar Similar, what's going to come up in 1893 with Queen Lili Okalani. Okay, and I'll get to that. So what happened then is now we're under British rule. The chiefs, Hotley Leo, Richards, and Simpson are in Great Britain going to France, going to Belgium, talking to King Leopold. They're trying to get Great Britain to recognize Hawaiian independence, to allow it to separate, right? They want the French to recognize that because also had French aggression in 1839 and the Americans to recognize that. So they needed to get three powers at that time to recognize. A letter was sent to Timoteo Ha'alileo from Matayo Kekuanoa. The letter says to, to Ha'alileo, we've been taken over, been taken over by a British naval officer. Your job is important. You must secure Hawaiian independence even if you gotta die. That's how serious things were getting back then. So, Holly Leo, Richards, and them, they're on a mission. Well, they were able to, um, well, while they're working on that, word gets back to the British Admiralty in Valparaiso. Valparaiso is in uh, Chile, right? South America. Admiral Thomas, he's the naval officer in charge of the Pacific area. He comes to Hawaii because he gets word Lord Paulette took it over without orders from higher up. He arrived in Hawaii, this was in July, and he had a meeting with Commander III, apologized to him as to what happened, and there was a, 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 a ceremony done on July 31st at a place what we call Thomas Square today, named after Admiral Thomas. And the British flag was lowered and the Hawaiian flag was flown. And then at um, Kauai Ha'o Church, Kamehameha III said, where he uttered the words, Ua maukea o ka'aina i kapono. The life of the land is perpetuating what is done justly, what is right, because the British saw what was right and returned. Okay? That's where that motto came from. Now, as Hawaii is evolving into a constitutional system, you have a new constitution coming up in 1852 and then one in 1864, okay? And in 1864, that, that constitutional system was not an increase of power by Commander V, contrary to what you hear or what you read in the history books written by Americans, right? Even some Hawaiians now citing these American historians. Actually, Commander V, was seeking to remove a certain um, provisions of the Constitution that would make it have more checks and balance. One particular provision in the Constitution of 1852 that they needed to change 
was Article 45, which says the king could do what he wants without the legislative approval as long as he has approval from the prime minister, the Kuhinanui. No check and balance. Commandment III wanted that in because of French aggression, because of American, uh, uh, British aggression, where he thought he could just transfer Hawaii to the United States for protection. You can't wait to call the legislature together. So you have to react. So that provision was in there. By the time Commandment IV came into power, and then the fifth, they knew that that was outdated. Hawaii is a country, and it, they've already dealt with the threats. Now they gotta move forward. So what he had was a constitutional convention where they all came together and they all agreed, delegates and nobles in convention to remove the office of prime minister, replace that prime minister with a cabinet minister who will sign anything by the king because no act by the king would be valid unless signed by a minister who is held accountable to the legislature. You see that check and balance. That didn't exist before. The Kuhinanui could do it on her own. There's no check. They pulled that in. Then they also got rid of Article 45. Well, one provision, Article 61, is where the delegates couldn't agree, the ones who were represented by elected people. Voter qualifications. You got to own property. Now, where did that come from? Why is Commandment the Fit talking about voter qualifications? Like they gotta know how business operates. They either gotta own property or they gotta have a leasehold property. Well, did you know at that time, natives actually had property, contrary to popular belief. The Mahele, the Land Commission, Royal Patent Grants, they all had title. But Commander the Fifth and the Fourth had an experience, I believe it was 18, must have been 1856 or 57, I'm not sure on the date. A budget was about to be passed to run government, right? You need a budget. Because if you don't have a budget, government shuts down, right? Well, they had a budget coming up. The nobles in a separate house passed the budget. The representatives didn't. Commandment of Fort is looking at this going, government's going to shut down. <laughs> I mean, shut down. He tried to get them to deal with it. Politics was going on in the House of Representatives. So what Commandment of Fort did, he dismissed the legislature out of session he reconvened another legislature who elected whose purpose is to pass the budget so government doesn't shut down they passed the budget got it done what they decided was in the convention instead of keeping the two separate houses nobles and representatives separate from each other the 1864 constitution or in the in the convention they're going to agree to make it one legislative assembly from what is called bicameral to unicameral. So now the nobles will be looking directly at the representatives and the representatives looking directly at the nobles and don't play that game again of threatening to not pass a budget. So that was another provision that they wanted to address in this new constitution. So Kamehameha wanted people in the legislature who knew how business operated. Otherwise you're gonna have another Hanaho, right? With the possible budget not being approved. So, the delegates were all concerned about that. So they got stuck, they didn't want to vote on it. One time around, two times around, third time, Commandment of Fitz said, you know what, Paul, I'm gonna come out with a new constitution. I absolve the convention, and I'm coming out with a new constitution. And you know that provision, Article 45, which said it, the king could do things with the approval of the Kuhina Nui, the prime minister, without approval from the legislature? They made an agreement that Kamehameha is going to terminate the 52 Constitution. So they used the provision in the Constitution that they were trying to get rid of to actually come out with the new Constitution. So they said, this Constitution is over, Legis the Convention is dissolved, and I'm coming out with a new Constitution, which was the same Constitution that was approved by the Convention with the voter qualifications. And in there, there was no provision of Article 45, so no future king could do what Commandment the Fit did without legislative approval. Eventually, that property qualifications was repealed in 1874, after 10 years. So they repealed it. What's interesting is the 1864 Legislative Assembly called together. John E.E., e., 
one of the associate justices on the Supreme Court, and two others were selected to be a committee to respond to Commemorative Fitz's speech to the legislature about the new constitution. In their letter to the king, they thanked him. Thank you for removing that absolute authority because it would be the source of untold evils in the future because a king in the future could do the same thing. In this case, it's not in that provision. Now, untold evils, we're talking about the Bayonet Constitution of 1887. King Kalako was forced to sign the Bayonet Constitution, a new constitution, without the legislative approval. That's a direct violation of the 1864 Constitution. That's illegal. Commandment of uh, Kalakaua could not claim the same right that Commandment of Fit did. So basically, what happened in 1864 prevented 1887 from legally taking place. But 1887 was the beginning of the insurgency. How are you guys so far with this? Am I, you guys following along? Am I losing anybody? Any questions so far? Um, I, I guess I have a book that covers what I'm talking about right now the constitutional evolution prime minister all that stuff yeah but the 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 the, the capital was moved from Lahaina to Honolulu yeah yeah Kamehameha the third yes Well, actually, it was moved because a lot of activities was taking place in Honolulu. In fact, Lord Paulette arrived in Honolulu. He was demanding in Honolulu. And Commander III had to come from Lahaina to deal with Lord Paulette. So whatever decision was made to move the capital from Lahaina to Honolulu, I think had a lot, of, a lot to do with the uh, foreigners and uh, dealing with problems. I mean, you want to be right there where they are. Yeah. So that, it was a good move. Oh, one thing about Lahaina. In the, um, in the Privy Council, Kioni Ana, he's a son of Olohana, he's half Kanaka, half uh, British or English. He's the Kuhinanui at that time with Commandment III. And he said that uh, in the Privy Council records, they need to build a, a prison in Lahaina. Prior to that, the prison was on Kaolave, right? And the reasoning he said we need to build the prison on Lahaina because the natives who are in prison on Koholawe are swimming home. <laughs> and the non-natives are stuck on the island. <laughs> that was interesting when I read that in the, <laughs> in the Privy Council. You know, they did it, oh my God, how are we going to deal with this? Hawaiians are swimming home. <laughs> so, now getting to 1887, that's the beginning of the insurgency. But a lot of people don't realize what, what got that going, okay? You guys don't mind I share this this history, huh? Because this is what a class is about. Okay. So, 1875, the Hawaiian Kingdom has a treaty with the United States, a trade agreement called the Recipros Reciprocity Treaty. Reciprocity is reciprocal trade relations. So, certain goods from the American market coming into Hawaii will enter Hawaii duty-free. You don't have to pay a, a tax on it. And certain goods from Hawaii are going to be imported into the United States duty-free. One of those products is sugar, right? So sugar is a national industry in the Hawaiian Kingdom, like how automobiles is an industry in Detroit, right? It wasn't like some colonial extension of a, of a colonial power. It was actually regulated by Hawaiian law. So what happened was um, uh, this, this treaty was making the sugar plantation owners in Hawaii very fat. They were making a lot of money. Now, why would they make a lot of money? This is after the Civil War, right? This is 1875. Civil War is already pow. They don't have slaves now to, to cut down the sugar cane, to produce the sugar. They got to pay them, right? Actually, it costs less to buy Hawaiian sugar than it was to buy American sugar. And that's what led to the CNH sugar california and hawaii sugar they send the raw sugar up to california they process and sell these guys were getting rich now the sh american sugar plantation owners and the sugar industry was a bit angry with the, with the american government 
because it's like allowing Toyota come in from Japan and selling it cheaper than Oldsmobile, right? Everybody's gonna buy the Toyotas. So uh, Cleveland, who was the president at that time in 1884, because that treaty is gonna last 10 years until 1885. The Americans are thinking of terminating the treaty. Well, what Cleveland said was, well, I can justify the treaty if you allow Pearl Harbor to be given exclusive use to American cargo ships to do trade with the East, right? So in 1884, they signed a, an amendment to the, the treaty, but it had to be approved by the Hawaiian legislature. 1884, Joseph Navahi from Hilo, Pilipo, all these Hawaiian legislators said, no, aole. Because when America comes in with uh, refueling and coaling in Pearl Harbor, they're going to eventually take over our country. So it stopped. The legislature came into session two years later, 1886. Sanford Dole was a representative, so is Lauren Thurston. Still, no. 1886, that's what led to 1887, when the, session, the legislature is out of session. They basically have a coup, have, commemor the, uh, have Kalakaua, forced to sign the bayonet constitution. Now the term bayonet is a knife that you put in front of a rifle. So to call a constitution a bayonet constitution pretty much is revealing it's an illegal thing. That started the insurgency. So they're getting rich because the cabinet, right after they convene uh, the legislature, the cabinet who has no control over Kalakaua, they ratify or approve that amend amendment to the treaty. But another thing pops up in 1890 called the McKinley Tariff Act. McKinley, when he's in the Congress, introduced a bill that says, you know what, not only Hawaiian sugar comes in duty free, all sugar comes in duty free. So now Hawaii sugar plantation owners got to compete with the Spanish in the Philippines, got to compete with the Bolivians, the Colombians. Yeah. Well, what they want is in. Now in 1890, what's also happening is our people are rising up and they're taking the country back from the insurgents. Finally, in 1890, 1893, see now I'm getting to 1893, which is what we're going to be covering here. <laughs> These insurgents, head, headed by Lauren Thurston, who's not an American, even though he's Haole, he's actually Hawaiian, and he was a Hawaiian attorney, right? Remember, Hawaiian is a nationality, like British. You can be black and be British, you can be black and be Hawaiian. Hawaiian is short for Hawaiian subject, right? So, what ends up happening is uh, Lauren Thurston and his group meets with John Stevens, right? The U.S. ambassador, and says, we need help. We need you to land your troops to protect us. And we're going to make it like we're the new government. You recognize us. And we will give Hawaii to you because John Stevens wants Pearl Harbor. Right? And he's looking at these guys being desperate. And he, there's a term that, that Stevens used in a dispatch to Washington, D.C. He says, the pear is ripe to be plucked because of the political environment going on. And what's happening, the economics. So what was agreed upon was that Stevens would order U.S. Marines, 166 of them, to land in Honolulu on January 16, 1893. When they landed, they marched up Mililani Street, which is between Ali'u Alani Hale, where Kamehameha's statue is, that's the government building across from Iolani Palace. And today there's the federal post office that used to be the uh, music hall, yeah? So they're going to march up there and they're going to set, uh, position themselves in a defensive position between two buildings facing the palace and the government building, preparing to protect the insurgents when they declare, them, declare themselves to be a new government. Because these guys are about to commit high treason, right? And Marshal Charles Wilson, who's a Hawaiian, but he was Tahitian, Tahitian Haole, but Hawaiian, he's in charge of the police force and he's ready to take them down no matter who's standing in front of them, right? So here's the U.S. Marines landing, and they arrive with Gatling guns, cannons, rifles, uh, stretchers, medical supplies. They were ready to engage, right? So then, the next day, these in the individuals, these insurgents, and you know, I'm giving them a little praise right there. They're not even insurgents, they're cowards. <coughs> because I'm former military. 
I would have more respect for them being insurgents with a gun to defend themselves as opposed to going up there with a piece of paper to read and relying on U.S. Marines to protect them. See, that's a coward, right? But they had the cue from the U.S. ambassador, don't worry, you're going to get protected. So they go into the government building and they read the document, we are the provisional government. And then they start to, Samuel Damon starts to get Lili Uokalani to give up, right? Give up because they already recognized us. Okay, right off the bat, from international rules, that shows that you're not successful in your revolution if you're trying to have the queen give up her authority after the United States already recognized them as the new government. You see the problem here? Because they weren't in control. And the only way you can become a successful revolution is when you are in complete control. The United States, in their revolution with Great Britain, from 1776 to 1783, it took them seven years to get control. Here in Hawaii, we're talking about like 24 hours. <laughs> it was a game that's been played. Finally, the queen said, I will yield my authority to the United States so that they can do an investigation of the US military that arrived here. And I do this under protest and I'm impelled by United States forces. She didn't give up the country, she yielded her authority to arrest these people for treason. That's when she told Charles Wilson, the marshal, stand down. Kapu Aloha started back then. And she told the people, stand down. Let the investigation take place. Well, what was overthrown in 1893 was not the country, the Hawaiian kingdom, it was the government. To overthrow a government does not mean you overthrew the country. When I was in the army in 1990, Saddam Hussein overthrew the Kuwaiti government by invading Kuwait. By overthrowing the Kuwaiti government, he did not overthrow Kuwait as the country. He called that situation occupation. Until you get a treaty of peace that transfers Kuwait to Iraq, or you get a treaty of peace transferring Hawaii to the United States, Hawaii is still a country. So we have to keep in mind, what was overthrown in 1893 was not the country, the Hawaiian kingdom. It was the government. Now, whether or not that was illegal will come up in an investigation because President Cleveland, in March of 1893, is going to receive Queen Lili Okalani's protests. And he said U.S. troops were involved. President Harrison, the previous administration, didn't mention that. That is when he went to the U.S. Senate and removed the treaty that attempted to transfer all of Hawaii to the United States from the insurgents. That's when he appointed James Blunt to come to Hawaii to investigate. And James Blunt understood international law because he was a chairman on the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. That's what he used to be. So he came to Hawaii and on April 1st, he lowered the American flag and put up the Hawaiian flag. Not the British flag, the Hawaiian flag. And he started his investigation and made his reports, periodic reports, between April and July 17, 1893. These reports came to be known in our history books as the Blunt Reports. What he's doing is he's, re he's investigating and sending reports to Secretary of State Walter Gresham in Washington, D.C., who's his boss. Secretary of State Gresham is looking at it after the final report on July 17th, and he comes up with his recommendation to the president on October 18th, 1893. And he says, what was overthrown in Hawaii was the government and we have to restore it. And it was done under threat of war. Now he's using these words, right? That's what prompted President Cleveland on December 18th to then present a message, send a message to the US Congress, making the final conclusion. And he said that the U.S. landing of troops in Honolulu was in and of itself an act of war. Now, as a country, when one country admits that was an act of war, you bring in the laws of war and the laws of occupation. That's what triggers it. And then he concluded that the government of a friendly and confiding people has been overthrown by an act of war. And we must restore the queen to her position. That was the finding, right? But the U.S. Congress would not allow President Cleveland to follow through and send the troops back to Hawaii to restore the Queen. 
because they were playing games over there. One of the particular games that was being paid, played was from Senator Morgan, John Morgan. He's head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. See, what happened was the blunt report in Cleveland's message was a scathing indictment of the U.S. Ambassador and Captain Wiltz of the USS Boston. Because these two people had diplomatic immunity, they couldn't be prosecuted in Hawaii. They had to be prosecuted by the sending country. On the statute that looked or resembled the statute they violated in the host country. And that was called treason. Stevens and Wiltz would be prosecuted for treason under American law. That's how you deal with diplomats who have diplomatic immunity. Senator Morgan is going to stop, he's going to try to stop that. So he starts a committee in the Senate Foreign Relations to investigate the so-called overthrow. And he's only taking testimony in Washington, D.C. Insurgents are coming up there. The problem is the Senate is part of the legislative branch of the United States. They have no effect outside of the United States. Only the president through the executive branch, whether military or diplomats. James Blunt was a diplomat, special commissioner. President Cleveland was the head of the executive branch. His determination cannot be affected by a report or an investigation by the legislature. Sort of like what you see with... Um, uh, uh, in Clint with Clinton and they're doing that Benghazi investigation it's like they're throwing up smoke and mirrors it didn't affect anything with the executive branch and Clinton as a Secretary of State but it created problems right smoke that's what they want to do create smoke so their purpose was to vindicate Stevens and Captain Wiltz in the first one of the first hearings in January of 1894 John Stevens comes up. He's now being drilled by Senator Morgan. And Senator Morgan specifically says, did you intervene in the internal affairs of the Hawaiian Kingdom to overthrow the government? Because when you intervene, that's treason. Your internal is violating, your, um, you're not supposed to violate the internal affairs of a country, right? He says, no, absolutely not. This was a revolution on their own. Okay. Well, half the committee didn't believe him. The other half did, but they were split. So Morgan had to side with the half that said that he was vindicated. So you have what is called a minority report and a majority report. But it's still limited to U.S. territory, right? It's part of the spoken mirrors that they're going to use to try to prevent the Congress from allowing President Cleveland to send their troops back. It, that's all they're going to use it as. Now let me fast forward to three years ago. William O. Smith... Okay, he was the Attorney General of the so-called Provisional Government. He's an insurgent. Anybody here who are from Kamehameha? Anybody from Kamehameha? Okay, you guys know of uh, Smith Hall? Named after William O. Smith, the traitor. <laughs> so there's now a move to change the name. <laughs> because now we're looking at, oh, these names have meanings now. <laughs> well, W.O. Smith was the Attorney General. He had records that he kept. Bad move. Records that he kept. It was put in a vault in some place. I don't know the, truth, the, the full story of it. But eventually it was given by his family to the uh, Hawaiian Mission House, the archives. A friend of mine, Ron Williams, who has a PhD in history, he's part of the Mission House. He went there and went through all the records. What he found was, a, was two smoking guns. Lili Wokalani signed her protest on condition that it will be given to the President of the United States. It wasn't. Her original protest was in the box. Sanford Dole and them didn't take it, uh, did not allow Lauren Thurston and to take it with them. Because how could you take it with you? You're trying to give away to the United States. So that shows they lied, these insurgents, to the Queen. That popped up. The second smoking gun, <laughs> On January 17, 1893, there's a, a, a correspondence from Stevens to John, to uh, Sanford Dole, the head of the so-called provisional government, with the letterhead U.S. Legation, which is U.S. Embassy, and Stevens' signature. And he says to Judge Dole, do not let people know that I recognize you before you're in control of the governmental machinery and the police station. This whole thing was based upon them being, being in control. That's exactly also proves that he intervened in the internal affairs of Hawaii. So he perjured himself in front of uh, Morgan. You know, so 
this is a lesson learned for us. Be careful what you write. When you're on email, you're on Facebook, be careful. Because <laughs> what you say or what you write could be used against you. Let's learn from John Stevens what happened to him. That's over 100 years ago. But our history is now falling into place. So what I want to close with this workshop is what happened in 1893 was not the overthrow of the country. It was the overthrow of the government that was illegal and President Cleveland said we must restore it. So the country never left. The next step is, well, how did Hawaii become a part of the United States, right? And that's what we're going to get into at 315, um, that presentation and another handout. Now what I covered here for you folks quickly is most of, some of the information I shared is in this article with the National Education Association. You notice I say here in the title, the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom government, not the Hawaiian Kingdom. We gotta start using the right words, right? Also what I have is a letter from the Swiss, uh, from the United Nations in Switzerland. And basically, this um, United Nations uh, expert, it's, a, it's an appointed position through the Human Rights Council, he says, I have come to understand, so even he gets educated, right? I have come to understand that the lawful political status of the Hawaiian Islands is that of a sovereign nation state in continuity, meaning it still exists because what was again overthrown? The government. So the country will still exist. But a nation state that is under a strange form of occupation by the United States, resulting from an illegal military occupation and fraudulent annexation. As such, international laws, the Hague and Geneva Conventions, require that governance and legal matters within the occupied territory of the Hawaiian Islands must be administered by the application of the laws of the occupied state, in this case, the Hawaiian Kingdom. If the Hawaiian Kingdom didn't exist, doesn't exist, he wouldn't be saying that because the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists and its laws still apply. And it says not the domestic laws of the occupier that must be applied here. So these talks that I'll be having is helping to understand these terms, these documents, and historical events. The last document is the Larson case at the Permanent Court of Arbitration. The word nation state refers to a country. Today, international law uses the word state, independent state. You will notice here that the Permanent Court of Arbitration from 1999 to 2001 acknowledged that the Hawaiian Kingdom, which is a defendant, you notice it says state, state. That means it still exists. And this is 1999 to 2001 from an international court. So it, it's important that we need to know the language that everyone else is talking outside of Hawaii because we're using the wrong language. We gotta make sure we use the right language. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. Um, so what I think I'm hearing is there is a difference between a national Hawaiian nationality that representing the government and people with Hawaiian blood. Because there's other people that have no Hawaiian blood and they're still considered Hawaiian, whereas those that have the Pokemon is a whole different entity or how does that because Okay, good good question. Very good question. So so let me explain this. Okay, so the word Hawaiian. First of all, let's look at where that word came from. It's you, my grandma taught me was hey Hawaii out. Was A N came from a university that Anna. Okay, actually, uh, so 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 let so remember how history is important. So before I can answer that, let's let's look at where did the word Hawaiian come from, right? The word Hawaiian. You see the word Hawaiian Kingdom. You see the word Hawaiian Islands used in the 1800s. So America didn't create it. The university didn't create it. 1800s they created it. But who created it in the 1800s? It actually was created by Hawaiian chiefs. Because Hawaiian is an English word. A-I-I-A-N. That's English. Here's the story behind that, and I cover this in my book, Uamau, which is my dissertation put in a, in, in a history textbook form. So at this meeting, I believe it was 1827, a council of chiefs got together, and the topic was, changing the name from Sandwich Islands to Hawaiian Islands. Okay, the English. 
So they all passed a resolution saying, yes, we're going to change the name from Sandwich to Hawaiian. Now, to understand the complexities of that, in the native language, when you say Sandwich Islands, it's Ko Sandwich by Aina. Okay? What is Ko? Possessive. Somebody owns something, right? What is Sandwich, the subject? Pai Aina, the islands. So Ko Sandwich Pai Aina are the islands that belong to Sandwich. That's, that's, that's what it means. And they're saying, I'm only putting my voice in, in them. I'm not sure they said this, but he said, I, I, I've never met Sandwich. Who is this guy, Sandwich? He wasn't in the battles <laughs> of Nu'uanu. You know, do you eat this guy? You know, is he a sandwich? I'm joking. <laughs> so they decided to change it from Sandwich to Hawaiian. So they came up with the Holy Word. Yep, the Council of Chiefs with Kahumanu Kamehameha the Third. Yeah. So now you take that that translation in the native language of Hawaiian Islands. It's Ko Hawaii Pai Aina, the islands that belong to Hawaii. Remember, I gave the talk earlier when I started off. When Kamehameha was king, he was the king of the kingdom of Hawaii. Kahikili was the king of the kingdom of Maui. Kael was the king of Kauai. Maui and Kauai kingdom were consolidated. Kana'i Alpuni. By Kamehameha I. So basically, when you say, these are the islands that belong to Hawaii, that's exactly right. It doesn't belong to Kauai. It doesn't belong to Maui. But if Kael succeeded like Kamehameha did in consolidating Hawaii Island Kingdom, Maui Island Kingdom, it would be, we would be called Kauaiians. If Kahikili succeeded, we'd be called Mauians. But we are Hawaiian. Now the word Hawaiian is a geographical location. It's not a group of people. It's Hawaii. That's called a nationality. So when we talk about Britain, Britain is a location. That's why you're British. That's not a people. That's a geographical location. So for Hawaii, Hawaiian refers to the country called the Hawaiian Kingdom, or the islands that belong to Hawaii, and the nationality are Hawaiian. So Hawaiian is short for Hawaiian subject, like British is short for British subject. Though that's not ethnic. So what do we call the native people of Hawaii? Right? That's the ultimate question. What do we call ourselves? Well, let's take a look at Bernice Pawahi's will in 1884. Article 13. In her will, remember she's from that time, so we can we can take that as a good indicator. She says financial aid will be given to those Hawaiians of Aboriginal blood, pure part. Pure is Kanaka Maoli, part is Hapa. But you can be Hawaiian and not be Aboriginal, because you could be Haole. Because remember, Hawaiian is a nationality. The reason why we think of Hawaiian being ethnic, because of Hawaiian Homes Act, 1921, blood quantum, right? Oha, uh, blood quantum. That's all American law, that's not Hawaiian law. So we will be referred to as Aboriginal Hawaiian. Not indigenous Hawaiian, Aboriginal Hawaiian, or natives. No. Did I answer that? Okay. So again, terminology, uh, we have to be careful how we use it. So we have to go back into time to know how they used it in order to know how we use it today because we're dealing with the problem that hasn't gone away since 1893. So we need to go back into their shoes on how would Navahi see this? How would Kaulia see this? Not how do I see this? Because I don't know. My talk that I'm going to be giving at 3.15 will be getting into not only the occupation of Hawaii, but why we don't know, but now we're beginning to know, right? So you might call it, uh, we are recovering our memory that hasn't changed. So again, the practical value of history is that it's a film of the past run through the projector of today onto the screen of tomorrow. That film never changes, but we have to update our projector to process the film. Once we process the film, now we see something we didn't see before. So the focus is not what we should do. The focus should be what happened. Because once you know what happened, you're going to know what you got to do. That's why you capitalize on successes and you learn from mistakes. With that, mahalo. Kind of went over 15 minutes. Kalamai.